what role will AI play in the architectural office of the future? Indeed, what is AI and how will it help us to design? Arguably, this year will be known as the year in which architecture, architects eventually woke up to the possibilities of AI. I say this for two reasons. Firstly, it was the year in which the first mainstream books in the English language about AI and architecture were published, including two of my own. But secondly, and perhaps more importantly, it was the year in which diff the diffusion platforms were launched. DALI, Midjourney, Stable Diffusion, and so on. And these have radically transformed the way in which we can use AI in architecture. The great advantage of these platforms is they not only produce far more uh, uh, clear uh, drawings than the use of generative adversarial networks in the past, but they also can operate very quickly. In the matter of seconds or even maybe minutes, you can produce the design and within two hours, you can produce a whole scheme. Moreover, they're exceptionally easy to use. You don't have to have any advanced knowledge of computation to use them. All you need to do effectively is write prompts, words, instructions. And what these prompts do is they connect up with images via captions to be found on the internet. So you write a, a prompt in words and it produces images that relate to those prompts. And often they will produce designs that we would never have thought about ourselves. As such, we can perhaps de describe these particular platforms as a form of prosthesis to the human imagination that allow us to open up the possibilities of what we might be able to uh, uh, design. These days, of course, we think of AI not as in opposition to humans, but as an extension of human intelligence. So these stable, these, these, these diffusion platforms could be understood also as a prosthesis, as an augmentation to the human imagination. And we write the prompts and the prompts define everything. We become prompt engineers. We could, design, we could write a prompt, for example, that, that describes a hotel room in the style of Zaha Hadid, and it will produce something that is remarkably similar. These platforms are extraordinary. I've never met anyone who's used them who hasn't been blown away by them. The quality of the images is exceptional. They are so easy to use and so quick. They are, in many ways, a game changer in architectural design. But at the same time, we have to recognize that these are simply two-dimensional images. We might get a sense that they're describing three-dimensional forms, but they're not three-dimensional. They're simply describing images. Moreover, we might get a sense they've got a clear understanding of materiality, of performance, of behavior, but actually they have no understanding of that. They're simply sketching tools that describe something. At the same time, one of the important roles of these platforms is they offer us, offer us a tantalizing glimpse of the potential in the future. They begin to suggest to us what AI might be capable of in the future. In the words of Alan Turing, this is only a foretaste of what is to come, a shadow of what is going to be. So what is going to be? What will it be like to operate in the office of the future. Firstly, we are not going to be surrounded by humanoid robots, but we are going to be surrounded by AI. There's a popular myth for some reason that robots equal AI, but robots do not equal AI, no more than a Tesla car equals AI. Robots might be controlled by AI, but they are not AI. This myth perhaps is fed to us by the movies. Instead, if we want to think AI, don't think humanoid robot, think algorithms, think software. AI is essentially software, very sophisticated software, but software nonetheless. And because it's software, it's effectively invisible. But we are every day already surrounded by AI. Our, our, on our phones, for example, we have various AI powered apps. We filter out the spam on our emails using AI. We, Gmail finishes off the, our sentences using AI. WeChat translates text using AI, and so on. We can recognize our friends on Facebook using AI. Meanwhile, 
In the home, AI is what, what controls Siri and Alexa. It's what controls our Nest thermostats. It's what, control, it's what controls our Roomba vacuum cleaners. And in the car, it's what warns us when we're straying out of lane. It's what tells us the quickest route and so on. We are surrounded by AI the whole time, but it is invisible. It is as though the earth has been invaded by a super intelligent, invisible alien species. So what exactly is AI? According to Margaret Bowden, AI seeks to make computers do the sorts of things that minds can do. But is that correct? For example, there are many domains or certain domains in which AI outperforms human beings. In games of Go and chess, for example, the human experts will no longer stand any chance of beating AI. And similarly, there is a huge difference between AI and human intelligence. We might use the term neural network to describe a deep learning neural network, uh, and we might use the terms neurons and synapses to describe the components of that network, but they are very different to the neurons and synapses of the human brain itself. The main difference between AI and human intelligence is that AI is not conscious. It's not sentient. It's not self-aware. It doesn't know what it is doing. It might be beating us in a game of chess or go. It doesn't even know that it is playing chess or go. AI cannot think any more than your pocket calculator can think. But does AI need to be self-conscious? Maybe not. Does it need to have a consciousness? Probably not. As long as it does what it's meant to do effectively, who cares? So maybe AI doesn't need to replicate certain things about the human mind. So what will it be to operate in the office of the future? We have some understanding of what it's going to be like because the AI that is being developed right now will be available in three to five years time and it will completely transform the way in which we operate. At the moment, the way that many office offices operate is they might, for example, do an early study, a sketch, for example, in Maya. Then they would translate that into Rhino and eventually uh, further into BIM and so on and so on. There is a series of discrete steps involving discrete software that is used in order to generate a design. Well, in the office of the future, there will be a single platform that goes all the way from data to fabrication, and all that will be resolved. Moreover, that platform will be able to tell us various things. It will be aware of building controls, of building constraints, of planning uh, control, and so on. It will be able to conform to all those requirements. And what's more, it will be able to calculate the structural behavior, the acoustic behavior, the thermal behavior of the buildings that are being designed. And what's more, and perhaps most importantly, in a few years' time, it will be able to design buildings completely autonomously. And that, of course, is a huge advantage in many ways. But there's also a dark side to that. With a, a self, once you have a self-driving car, you, all, you no longer need a driver. And once you have an AI system that is able to generate buildings completely autonomously, you perhaps don't need an architect. What is the solution to all this? I'm not sure I know. But it would seem to me the most important thing is to be able to be aware of the, of the problem. Because once you're aware of a problem, it becomes a different kind of problem. It's not a problem by which you are trapped, but it's a problem by which, with which you can potentially deal. To my mind, then, the real challenge that faces architects today is not to design more progressive buildings, Rather, it is to think of ways to how to, to allow the profession to survive. What we need to do right now, it would seem, is to design the very future of our profession. Thank you.